we've now twice sort of broached the topic of anabolics as another tool because a couple of times you've made the point, which is, look, this is going to be about the limit. Your genes are going to start to become your limit. Um, so I guess my question is, well, let's let, you know, you, you, you've spoken very openly about anabolic steroids. I've, I've had several podcasts where I've covered this in detail, but, but again, let's, let's kind of tell people what we're talking about for reasons that are, um, maybe a little bit elusive. There's some con confusion about is testosterone an anabolic steroid? And, and of course the answer is absolutely yes, it is. And so- Wait a minute. <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. So, so let, let's talk about, um, anabolic steroid use in the context of non-medical use. So let's take testosterone replacement therapy where testosterone in a hypogonadal man is restored to typically the upper limit of a normal physiologic range. It's nice that they do the upper limit, right? Yes. Give everyone good genetics. And then, and then we'll just sort of take that off the table for a moment, park it in the context of what is what is anabolic androgenic steroid use look like in the physique bodybuilding community? Let's talk about the different drugs. Let's talk about your experience with it. Uh, let's talk about how much it can unleash. And let's, let's frankly talk about what the, what the pros and cons are. Um, because, um, you know, we, I personally have no experience with this. Um, we, you know, we just, that's not our patient population, right? We don't have patients that are coming in saying, my goal is to be jacked right. and I want some D ball and, <laughs> you know, it, so, so there's this not something we, we just have any understanding of. Yeah. So anabolic androgenic steroids are all derivatives of the testosterone molecule manipulated in various ways to accentuate some characteristics and de-emphasize other characteristics. They're typically taken by athletes uh, in the competitive sphere, bodybuilders, physique athletes, and gym people who want a super physiological level of muscle mass and sometimes uh, super physiologically low levels of body fat concomitant with that. And so they'll take anywhere between uh, high end testosterone replacement therapy dose to 10 or 20 times that amount per week. And they will do... Let, let me just pause there for a moment and just give some people some doses because we've talked about TRT before in the podcast. So um, we typically dose patients twice a week to try to get a smoother level as opposed to once a week. So if the, if the, if the ideal dose for a given individual to get them in the right spot is 100 milligrams of testosterone cypionate weekly, we would always prefer that the patient take 50 milligrams intramuscularly twice a week or sub-Q. Yeah. Um, I will tell you, Mike, I don't think we have ever given a patient more than 70 milligrams twice a week or 140 milligrams a week. Probably median dose for physiologic replacement is 40 milligrams twice a week or 80 milligrams a week. So are you saying that there are people out there that would routinely take 800 to 1600 milligrams of testosterone in a week? Oh, yeah. And... Sometimes that's not all testosterone, it's other steroids in combination. Usually people take at least that replacement level of testosterone, often more, um, because testosterone does some really good things for health and general function, and it tends to aromatize into estrogen quite readily, which is good because estrogen is cardioprotective, neuroprotective, um, increases your strength. It's actually Helps increasing your, your uh, tons, sex drive, um, it actually increases your... Um, anabolism in the presence of androgenic steroids uh, and testosterone. So estrogen by itself, not very anabolic. Estrogen in the presence of testosterone is more anabolic than if you had all the testosterone in the world, but were unable to aromatize to estrogen. And so baseline level of testosterone is often taken at somewhere between 250 milligrams a week and all the way up to a thousand milligrams a week, depending on how you're handling the side effects of that um, excess estrogen production at the higher levels. And that's usually taken in as cypionate? Uh, enanthate, cypionate. Some people prefer propionate if they inject every day. Mm -hmm. um, enanthate and cypionate are by far the most commonly used, seemingly. Um, oftentimes, people inject differentially, but uh, once daily injections seem to provide the smoothest curve. Yeah. Uh, if you put in half a week's worth of super physiological testosterone at one time, your mood for the next several hours is curious. 
it's not fun. I mean, I, yeah, help me understand what that even feels like. So, so let's just say you're taking 700 milligrams a week, 100 milligrams a day. So 7X physiologic. Do you feel something different? Most people feel something, but it's probably a normally distributed population of experiences where some people just can't tell. Some people feel something for sure that they can describe, and some people have panic attacks and will never use again, or they are driven to extreme violent thoughts and extreme sexual thoughts and actions. And those folks are quite rare, but they do happen. So there's a large distribution about which people can have experiences, but I'd say the median experience is you take everything, the easiest way to understand the average effect of a high degree of anabolic steroids and for simplicity, testosterone on the psychology is to imagine that what is the average psychological proclivity of a female? What is the average psychological proclivity of a male different in many regards? And then you move the needle over one notch into a magical new gender yep. Yep, called uh, enhanced male. And you just typically exhibit more male-like patterns of thought and behavior than even males do. But males compared to females is the best way to figure that one out because if you're like, just know what a male pattern of behavior is like because you're a male, you're like, what the hell is it like to be more like me? It's like everything about me? Well, it's not everything. We actually just had a recent um, video on the RP Strength channel. I think it's called... Um, Ro roid rage is real. We talk about like that steroids don't accentuate every quality you have, just the more masculine qualities. So what are the most masculine qualities? Again, this hits everyone a little bit differently, but on average, a um, you become quieter. Men typically are not as expressive as women. You become to show you come to show fewer facial expressions of emotion. Um, you don't process other people's emotions as well. You can't fine tune what they feel as much, and you don't care as much. So less empathy. Way less empathy, uh, all the way to similar levels of empathy, but on average, definitely less. And you become more likely to be irritable. You become more likely to have uh, anger and aggressive sorts of thoughts. You become more attuned to the dominance hierarchy in general, and you become more uh, you, you become someone who thinks more about where you stack up in the dominance hierarchy in a way that you take affronts and slights more poorly than otherwise. So if someone on social media says you're a bad person, if you're not on a lot of testosterone, you're like, I'm just having a bad day. That's okay. We all have a bad day. We need to rage out on someone. If you're on a lot of testosterone, you're more likely to be like, I wonder if he'd say that to my face. I wonder if he would be real quiet around me because he would know that I'm not someone to be messed with. Weird, weird thoughts like that. Women almost never have thoughts like that. Men have regular thoughts like that in the right context. People on steroids have more thoughts like that in almost every context mm -hmm. than uh, off, on, on average they would like to have. Another one is you become uh, linguistically less expressive and your fluidity of communication falls. So a lot of times when someone is using high levels of anabolic steroids in a relationship and that person happens to be male, the degree of communicative throughput falls substantially. Well, that's just generally not good for most relationships. Another one is sex drive. It's difficult for women to appreciate what the male sex drive is like on a quantitative and qualitative level. Both of those tend to magnify, especially if you're not bringing your estrogen down. You bring estrogen low enough, you don't even remember what the hell sex is for or why people are even in that sort of thing. But if you have a lot of androgens, a lot of estrogen, the hunger, the thirst becomes very annoying. Now, at that level of testosterone, are you taking an aromatase inhibitor or are you literally letting the estradiol get... I mean, I can't imagine how high the estradiol level becomes at that... As high as you want. So, so, so you're not... Um, so, so typically, you know, estradiol would be over 100 at that point. That's left alone? It depends. So it depends on a few things. One is different people respond differently, both physique and psychology to high levels of estrogen. High levels of estrogen for some people are like swimming in, in, in a pool of magical clouds and they love it and their physique looks great. They get in a nice and watery, their joints feel amazing, their recovery is awesome, their sleep is awesome, sex drive is awesome, everything's great. 
For some other people, they get a lot of estrogen and it actually uh, prevents them from getting good sleep at, at higher levels. They're water buffalo bloated and they can't even see their abs anymore, even though they're 8% body fat and they get mood swings, all this crazy stuff. And so it really is very individually dependent. It's, it's actually quite amazing. And this is not entirely unlike women, right? Women will, oh, yeah. if, if they're undergoing hormone replacement therapy in perimenopause, it's not a one size fits all. They can have tremendous variability in their response to estrogen and of course, progesterone. Yes. Huge, huge, huge. The other thing is what we're learning in uh, evidence-based approach to anabolic steroid utilization and performance enhancing drug utilization, it's called the safer use model. Probably the biggest promulgator of it is a gentleman named Joe Jeffrey in the United Kingdom. Super, super expert, exceptional bodybuilding coach, great bodybuilder's own, right? And uh, just reads literature all day long. And uh, folks like him tend to espouse that probably the best way to manage estrogen is to use some combination of exogenous drugs that are androgens themselves to get the estrogen level you have the best notable metrics at how you feel, how you look, how your blood work is, health, et cetera. So here's an example. You take a thousand milligrams of testosterone. I'm still wrapping my head around this, Mike, but okay. well, it actually goes into your thigh in a needle. You don't have to wrap your head around. <laughs> so it's intense. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, and you take a thousand milligrams of testosterone and that comes with a concomitant aromatization. So you have a lot of estrogen. Some people, they feel totally great. For some people, it's too much. For those that it's too much estrogen, they might be able to take 500 milligrams of testosterone and then 500 milligrams of primobolin. Primobolin is a synthetic anabolic androgenic steroid developed in, I think, the 60s and 70s. And it's designed not really to convert into estrogen hardly at all. Uh, other steroids like it are Masteron. They not only don't convert into estrogen, but they actually antagonize estrogen conversion for the testosterone you're shooting in to some extent. And so if someone's like way too much estrogen for them, they can do a 50-50 split of testosterone and primobolin so that now they get all the good estrogen from testosterone, but not too much of it, but they get most of that anabolic drive from the rest of the primobolin, but without any more estrogen addition. It could be 250 testosterone and 750 milligrams of primo. It can be 750 test. It can be 250 primo and anything between. And you kind of experiment that in a lot of bodybuilding coaches, what they're really good at is starting you on a certain cycle that they have the wisdom to know works for most people, and then leveling up one drug, leveling down another to get, among other things, kind of that testosterone, that androgen to estrogen uh, ratio to be something that you have your best performance at, best health, so on and so forth. But for the, um, the sex drive component, especially if you have a lot of estrogen going on, Qualitatively, it can uh, change. Quantitatively, it can change. Now, huge variation. Me personally, I never got like enormous sex drive upregulation from, I did get some, but nothing crazy. I've been up to as much as just north of 2,000 milligrams per week. And uh, I'm currently on only 250 milligrams per week, but my sex drive is more or less the same. Which to me makes me wonder, is there any difference in androgen receptor expression that you're able to appreciate between two, 250 and 2000? Are you so saturated in your androgen receptors already that like, do we actually know if there's a benefit to all the additional testosterone that you could have been on at almost 10x your current dose, 8x? Yeah. You won't know until you try. Did you appreciate a difference in positive effects? I don't doubt that there could be a difference in negative effects, mm -hmm. but if the positive effects are accrued through testosterone binding to the androgen receptor, that complex yeah. leading to more nuclear transcription, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't what you said suggest that you may have already hit maximum benefit yeah. of 250? There are some reasons to believe that your androgen receptor density escalates up when exposed to more mm. androgens and not down in some cases. And so that means the more gear you take, the more benefit you have rather linearly. In my experience, the experience of most people you talk to, it's again, slow newsreel, same asymptotic curvilinear relationship. For me personally, and this is something I didn't discover until quite recently, I would say, unfortunately so, I get probably almost the same gains at 1,000 milligrams that I do at 2,000. 
anything north for me of 1500 just drives me insane, like mentally insane, and seems to not really affect my physique hardly at all. How much water retention do you get at these doses? Considerable, although uh, if you manage your estrogen well, it's not as much as you would think. And but you managing get... estrogen with aromatase inhibitors? Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, sorry, I had a point there uh, back then. Aromatase inhibitors in many cases are incredibly toxic drugs. And you generally want to avoid taking them if you can. Sometimes you have to to get really dry for a contest, but that's only a few weeks out from the show. And so the modern wisdom, so to speak, with the evidence-based crowd, the safer use crowd, is to manage your estrogen with differential amounts of testosterone and non-estrogenically converting compounds like primobol and mastron versus taking just as much testosterone as you ever would, but taking an aromatase inhibitor on top of that. Because aromatase inhibitors in an unbelievable range of circumstances fuck you up. They're neurotoxic. They're cardiovascularly toxic. It's bad, bad news. These are the compounds you use when you have breast cancer and they're like, you're going to die if you don't take these. They are gigantic hammers for a very small nail. If you want to see who's done the worst to their health across the bodybuilding industry, it's whoever runs the most AIs, as we call them, aromatase inhibitors. And there are various other pharmaceutical ways to control estrogen. Probably the best way for health and effect is only use as much estrogenically converting drugs, nandrolone derivatives, um, and testosterone as you need to get whatever estrogen you feel best at. And the rest of the anabolic load should come from things like primobolin and mastron that don't really do much to estrogen at all, but increase your androgen and anabolism, so on and so forth. So and how do you differentiate between when you're using testosterone versus nandrolone? Mostly by experience. Nandrolone has some really cool positive effects, kind of exaggerated uh, versions of testosterone. Some people are naturally very dry. And so if they don't take an androlone for their very hard training cycles, they will have insufficient body and joint water hydration and they'll like joints will creak and they'll get hurt a lot and it's just really bad recovery. But you put them on nandrolone variant and all of a sudden they have enough intramuscular and intra joint water to where they feel great. Everything's working. Other people get on nandrolones and have so many of the side effects that they're like, well, this is way too much estrogen conversion for me. I'm a giant water buffalo. If I just take testosterone, I'm plenty hydrated, so I don't need to do that. And uh, nandrolones also have this curious side effect. It's colloquially termed deca dick because uh, nandrolone decanoate does a substance called deca. Um, it is the uh, is erectile dysfunction mm. approximately caused by the presence of nandrolones. And it's curious because nandrolones typically with their estrogenic effects elevate sex drive. Kind of the more estrogen you have to a point, the more sex drive you have if you have presence you have of androgen. Yeah. yeah. And so um, you're horny, but then like little, little Billy down there doesn't work as well as he used to or at all. And so if you're in that boat, you're like, well, look, like it's just trade off. How much of a benefit do I get in training versus, you know, how much is my wife or girlfriend going to hate me or hookup culture doesn't work for me anymore, so on and so forth. So lots of considerations there. Nothing generally better than to start out with a solid plan that makes sense with a coach that knows what they're doing at very low doses of everything and slowly play with compounds and scale up uh, the very notable, highly note your beneficial effects and highly note your deleterious effects or downsides and see where you can strike a balance that's acceptable to you and considers long-term consequences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Thank you.